Hi, it's Genji UK here again, back with uh, another PCB project. So this one's going to be pretty simple to build. Um, it's a Zorro 2 card, so you could fit this in uh, an A2000, 3000, 4000, or one of those uh, Matsa uh, A500 uh, Zorro uh, adapters, so you could use it on a 500. We'll perhaps test it within the, this video, actually, on the 500. Um, but yeah, but you stick a SID on there, yeah? And then you can use uh, Delhi uh, Tracker, I think it is. I think you can use the C64 emulator as well. I forget the name of it right now. I'll stick it up there. Um, that works. But that emulator is not that great, actually. It's a really powerful machine, I've found, to emulate C64 games, which is surprising. You'd think an 060 would be fast enough. Uh, it may just uh, you know, need a, a rewrite and an optimization, but nevertheless, we should be able to use this with a, uh, you know, a player, one of the players. There are a few available to play SID files. So I'm going to stick an ARM SID on there initially, I think. I might get the FPGA SID on there ultimately, I'm not sure. Or just a Nano, a Nano Swin SID. You can buy those pretty cheap now. We've got a couple of 7.4 series to go on here. One megahertz crystal. It supports the SMD version as well as the DIP version of the crystal. And then it's just like some resistors and caps and things, passives, connectors. Um, you do have, I think, a regulator. Oh, that's a jumper, sorry. Regulator. Uh, if you use an, an original SID. But because we're going to use one of those, uh, you know, either an ARM SID, an FPJ SID, uh, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the FPJ SID works the same way. You don't need anything other than 5 volts. Well, the 5 volts is going to come through from the Zorro connector here, so we don't even need the regulator. We don't need the filter caps under here either, if we're using an artificial SID. So it's going to be dead straightforward to assemble this. A couple more caps up here by the looks of things. I thought it would just be worth explaining what a SID is and why I am so excited about getting this board, actually. The SID chip you can see here, this one's a faulty one, it's, uh, I think I stuck it in a socket because it had some damaged pins or something, but anyway, that is an expired SID chip. It's the sound chip from a Commodore 64, so this chip was light years ahead of its time, in my opinion. It was uh, a full ADSR, you know, it had a full ADSR envelope, uh, attack, delay, sustain, release. Uh, so it's like synthesizer. Synthesizer. I think there's only three channels on this, uh, if memory serves. Um, but it was light years ahead of its time, and I just love the SID. I love the SID chip. I've got so much nostalgia for how this chip sounds. It's an amazing chip. Now, by the time the Amiga came out, one of the reservations I had, you know, I, what I didn't understand is in Paula, why did they not stick a SID? or even stick two SIDs, as well as the PCM side of things. That would have just been absolutely amazing. Uh, but that's just me being silly, really, and liking the uh, whole way the SID sounds. Um, so, yeah, the idea of getting a SID into an Amiga has been something uh, you know, I thought I've had for, for a long while, actually. You can do it. There are a few different ways to achieve that. One of them is called a cat weasel. I think there's a few different versions of that. Individual computers, I think, made those, but they're like rocking horse... Uh, excrement the impossible to find so your options are limited so as soon as i saw this sid board uh, on the pcb way i was like oh wow i've got to get one of those uh, now one of the guys in discord pointed out you're probably not going to be able to get it working with a 2000 actually there are some issues lots of people have been using these boards for years and never got it working in 2000 so just bear in mind it will probably only work in a 4000 or 3000 but uh, yeah, I'm going to start with a 2000. Let's try and uh, work out what the issue is, see if we can get this working in a 2000 or a 500. You can see here that's a Nano Swin SID. So this has got a little MCU on there. This effectively emulates a SID. So this is a nice drop in replacement uh, that you can, you know, put your old faulty SID away and uh, fit that in there. And you've also got things like the ARM SID. So there'll be a video coming up on this as well. Again, it's got a little MCU on there. Again, it's emulation based. I'll stick a link up there to the FPGA SID video. You can also get an FPGA SID now as well. So that is like a one-to-one -one replication of the original functionality of something like this with lots of nice features built in. But they're quite pricey, the FPGA SIDs, like 100 euros or more. An ARM SID, I'll set you back about 40 or 50 euros. A Nano Swin SID, about 15 euros roughly. So I'm going to start here by getting the uh, sockets and jumpers on. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do this build, really. Um, and I've got some crystals as well. We could get the crystal on. I'm not going to socket the crystal. We'll solder it straight on. Yeah, so you can see I've got one megahertz uh, crystal there. So we'll get that on as well. It's not obvious where pin one is there. There it is. Yeah, it's a square side there on the silk screen. So let's try and line that up. Yeah, I've got a jumper just floating there. Um, but yeah, we'll get these... Uh, these sockets and things on first of all I think 
But I'm really excited to get this because you know what? It doesn't need um, auto config. You know, it's dead simple. It's just going to sit on the uh, Zorro bus there. It's obviously going to have a specific address, and there's going to be some signal that dictates when you're actually addressing it um, versus other uh, Zorro devices, I, I suspect. So I figured I could build one of these for my 2000 and build one for my 4000 as well. So I'll just uh, solder one point there. I'll just uh, press the crystal to make it nice and flat. Putting a socket there might be an idea, but you know what? It's, it's never going to get changed, this crystal, is it? Yeah, there we go. It's got little standoffs look that stand it off of the board. I like simple builds like this. Just need to strain a couple of pins there that just bend down a little bit. See if we can get that on there. There we go. Just flip it over. This is one of those sockets with the solder. It's not flowing very well because it's just got a bit of oxidisation on the pins. So. Yeah, I should have really filed the pins a little bit first, but just heating a little bit with some flux. Yeah, there we go, that's flowed okay. Let's just give that one another flow. And that side's not so bad, actually. No, it's not flowing around the pin, look. There we go, it gets like a crown around the top of it when the pin is oxidised. Anyway, that's pretty straight, so I'll commit to soldering the other pins. Yeah, to be fair, most of them are all right, but look at that second one. Look at the second pin there. Can you see you get like a little ring around it? The bottom row there is not so bad. Most of the top ones are all right. But that second pin there is a problem now. If we uh, just heat that, it's still got a bit of flux there. You'll see that after a number of seconds, it starts to flow more normally. And if we had a bit more solder containing flux here, and we can get it on the tip. There we go. Just give it a bit more time. Yeah, you see, look, those two pins have gone the same now. Can you see those two pins have done the same sort of thing where it doesn't join at the top part of the pin? Yeah, the second pin's all right. So, yeah, this is one of those sockets, and uh, at least I've been able to sort of show you what I mean with that problem there. It generally doesn't happen to me, actually. It's, it's just on sockets that have been sat around for ages. I've just got one or two here that are like that. Yeah, there we go. That's not bad. We'll get that three-pin jumper on next. I'm not even sure what that's for, to be honest. I've got a parts list for this, which I will share along with the link where you can buy these PCBs. This came from PCBWay, actually. It's uh, you know a design on there that someone's sharing. They'll get, I don't know, a few pounds for each set of boards uh, sold or something like that. Uh, so it's good to support the uh, the designer there. So that's that done. So next we'll get the 20 pin socket on there. Now what's going to be done in about five minutes at this rate? Because there's just resistors and caps after this. I do need to think about how I'm going to wire this up in terms of testing. I might have to put the audio, you know, 3.5mm socket on there in order that I can connect some speakers up or something when I'm testing it in a minute. But ultimately, seeing the 4000, you can use the CD audio mix lead and you could mix the audio in there. Now, it would only go across one channel unless you mix the channels in such a way that when you join up to the stereo connector in the 4000, that you're not shorting the channels together. That makes sense. You could do that by a capacitor. You could couple them, mix them together. Um, sorry, mix them together, then couple them separately. I think that should work. You may need a resistor in place, actually, otherwise you'll get um, the merging. I do always go with more solder rather than less. Some people like to just get uh, the least 
uh, amount required but uh, yeah that's but yeah that's just uh, not the way I have uh, ever done soldering there we go so I haven't finished with the pin headers and things like that yet but uh, I'm just going to get one of the caps on next or two of the caps the 22 here mark 22 and uh, 47 there's no plus and uh, negative, you know, positive negative designation there. So I'm just going to test connectivity. Go from the ground point on this 74 series here and just see. Right, so there must be coupling. One must be coupling input, one must be coupling output. So I guess we need to test from over here maybe. I don't know where are those going. Now they're coupled here, look. So we're really puzzled as to what these are doing actually maybe the power goes through here so because the power is not connected via the jumper we're not going to see the ground there imagine you'd expect the positive to be jumping not the ground so that's a little bit strange actually I'm puzzled let's just say the positive side that is really weird that is really weird so well, this is one of the joys of working with a PCB you don't know much about. I am a guinea pig here. These were just available to buy and I went, oh, I'll have some of those. Uh, There's a problem with it. Um, ground is always on the uh, pin furthest away from pin pin one and pin one's here next to the semicircle. So that's ground. And uh, if we test the ground here, no ground. I think that's ground. No ground. Crystal, no ground. Yeah, and I've checked the same with the VCC. VCC is not wired up, and that's the problem with this. VCC and ground are not wired up on that. It's crazy. Look, no join. So, um, let's just test the 5 volts of the crystal. There should be, I think, 5 volts here. There you go. So the crystal's got, yeah, 5 volts. Yeah, and the crystal has uh, ground, as you can see. Yeah. So, just inspecting the board here super closely, you can see there's nothing on the top side to the ground or the VCC. The pads are just circled with a gap. Uh, and it's the same on this side. So I was like, well, I don't get it. So it needs a wire. We're going to need a wire to join the ground up and a wire to join the VCC. Uh, now, because I was fitting the capacitor, so this is the board, uh, the ground I measured from here. The left-hand side goes to the ground on these, but not here, obviously. So we're going to put the cap, but we're going to use this cap to kill two birds with one stone. It's a Panasonic FR series, this, so we'll mount the cap there, but then we'll bend the ground, so the ground is the one nearest the top side here. We're going to bend that over to there, like that, and then it'll have a ground, does that make sense? So solder, solder, snip off the ends, and uh, that's one of the wires dealt with. Yeah, there we go, so you can see what I mean, I'll just trim that extra leg off there. So I just literally pulled the leg out and over to the ground point. So the ground should now be joined as well as the cap fitted. So if we test again from here to there, yeah, there we go. So that's the ground dealt with, it's just going to be the 5 volts. So I don't know why, but somehow we seem to have omitted the uh, the 5 volts. And it's not that the jumpers are not in place. There's no traces going to those two pins at all on that IC. So I think that's just an accidental omission. So I'm literally checking everything on this as I'm going along, because you know what, I have no trust in this PCB. Um, there are some mistakes. The next one is that capacitor uh, there. That's the input, yeah? I was like, one of these is going to be input, one's going to be output. Why are they both with a negative towards the right? That can't be right, this is an input. Uh, and so that is wrong. You want the uh, negative towards the left-hand side. Uh, and you want the opposite on the other one. So that the silk screen there is correct, actually. Can't get that in. Where's the other pin? There it is. So yeah, all Panasonics. These ones are a bit uh, weedier. The good voltage, you know, like 16 volts, I think, but they're 85 degrees, but the Panasonic M series, so they'll be fine. Just for coupling the audio, it's not going to be an issue. I can't imagine it getting 105 degrees inside uh, there, and these caps aren't going to get hot, for sure. But yeah, I'm going to be paying extra attention to voltages, uh, and the data lines and things as well. I'm going to check absolutely everything on this before I dare test this with... Uh, any of mustard chips, even the alternative ones, you know, because that's what we're going to be using on this. So, yeah, that's all right. It just needs a little tweak because you can see it's just pointing to the left a little bit. I like these things to be symmetrical. It's just uh, me being a bit of uh, OCD, really. 
yeah there we go that's pretty straight so that's one on and as I say this is going positive left negative right because that's the uh, way that the signal's going and then this one wants to go the opposite way I want the negative towards the right hand side here as indicated on the silk screen So, when did you get a transistor? Now, these two resistors here were easy because it says on there 3K3, 3K3. But these have just got R4, R3, C11, R5, C4. So, yeah, inconsistencies, isn't there? I've got these say 470 peak if I were here. So, these are filter ones, I think. Don't need those, not worried about those because I'm not going to have an original SID on here. Uh, likewise, not fitting the regulator. Um, it would be good to get the uh, 10, uh, there's probably a 100 nanofarad cap goes here or something though, that might be for the VCC rail there. Um, I'm not really sure what this jump is for either at this stage, something to the 5 volts I think might just need that bridge one way to indicate we're just pass passing 5 volts straight through. I'll get the SID socket on next. So I'm going with turn pin for this, you could fit a ZIF socket, there's perhaps enough space around there to do that, although these things here they get in the way. Um, but I'm going with turn pin because, hang on, one of the pins is blocked here, remember I've got a bit of solder there. Um, yeah, if I'm fitting uh, SIDs that have been desoldered, they're going to have shorter pins. So that's another benefit of using a uh, turn pin socket. And likewise, if we're fitting uh, things that have got round pins, things like the arm SID, the swing SID, the FPGA SID, you don't want uh, a dual wipe socket there because you just spread the, uh, the socket connections when you stick one of those round pin devices in. Anyway, so let's get that on. A huge jump cut. This is over a week later, actually, uh, over the Christmas period. Uh, I got sick in between. I got the norovirus. So I had a uh, massive stomach uh, problems for a week. But anyway, I've spent, I would say, about three whole days messing with this, actually. The software side of this has been an absolute nightmare because I can't find any information out there uh, documenting what drivers and software and everything you need to get this card working. It is clear as mud. It really is. There's loads of stuff on Aminet. There's some readme files on Aminet. Very little information within them, you know, like in terms of dependencies. Uh, and that's one of the things I don't like about some of the stuff on Aminet. The older stuff, newer stuff, it's all right. It's quite clear with newer stuff on there as to what the dependencies are. And when I talk about dependencies, I'm talking about the you know, prerequisites libraries, the version of Kickstart or the OS that supported uh, and the CPU etc. Anyway, I'll talk about some of these things as we progress through this but let me just show you what's happening now. So it's this on, we're booting here with the TF536. Some of the things I've been doing here, I've used the TF530, I've used the stock 68K, I've had the ID adapter with the 68K and I've had the ID adapter with the TF520. I've used different board revisions, I've used different Kickstarter revisions and uh, in terms of the actual software itself I have messed with so many downloads from Aminet to do with you know, the, SID play the SID players there. The, the first problem I had was, and I'll sort of try and show you some bits of this, was the um, SID player. Uh, now it's called Deli Tracker. There are a few different versions of this, there's 2.34, there's 2.32 um, I think they both were, but the, the 234 is not a full install, the 232 is a full install. I had a problem where it got stuck thinking it was installed when it wasn't. That took me a bloomin' ages to work that out, to go into the environment archive directory and delete a config file, but it took me forever to work that out, it was, that, that was one of the problems. Um, you get different libraries um, for the Placid stuff, you see that follow there, it's a small icon, Placid. You get placid.library. There are about three or so versions of that. <clears throat> now, some of the guides have found say, oh, you need placid.library. That's how you use this SID card. No, you don't. You don't. There's a version for the cat weasel. Yeah. Now, the cat weasel, I don't think it works the same way. So, if you put the cat weasel file in the uh, libs thing, the player just hangs. And you're like, why is it hanging? And I think it's because it's, you know, invoking some code in the library there that goes to, you know communicates with the cat weasel 
and the cat weasel isn't there. So it's like that hangs, you know. You get all sorts of problems with some of these things. Even Frodo would just hang or reset the system. Anyway, long story short, if I show you deli tracking now, uh, now it was thanks to um, something Liv2 suggested last night actually. He'd been looking at this after me ranting about how painful it's been trying to get anything working on this card. And one of the things Liv pointed out, um, well actually it was kind of like a reflection thing. What I mean by that is I put a comment saying, the only thing I can think is maybe it's something in the address map. You know, there's, maybe there's a clash, you know, the address that this card sits at, Maybe there's something in the system I'm just not seeing, you know. And as soon as Liv read that, he went away and looked at how it works and stuff and checked that address range, and it sits the A0 um, you know, address range. And he was like, oh, hang on a minute, on a, a 500 or 2000, you know, OCS and ECS chips, that, I think, clashes with chip RAM or CIA stuff. So that perhaps is the problem. It's actually where it sits, you know, the, the base address of the car. So in a 4000... Apparently, because you've got AGA in there, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, so, long story short, I looked at the code last night, the actual executable I'm talking about, and I worked out, I think I'm going to hack it, and I've done a hack. I've got a hack of the, the code sat on the, my uh, drive here. We'll test that in a second. And I'm going to modify the card to change its base address. So, I'll show you those things in a minute, and we'll move it to EE e instead of A0, its address. Um, and that may get it working with 500 and 2000 motherboards and it should still work in a 4000 it's sufficiently high up in the Zorro 3 address range, well I think so I think it might be the Zorro 2 address range but anyway it's sufficiently high up the address range there that should mean it shouldn't clash so what was happening with this now the, the way things stand and I'll talk about how I've got this configured in a minute because if you ever want to set one of these up you need to do exactly the same thing but if we now load a SID file and go back one what was happening last night, this would uh, reset the 536. So when I click OK now, a split second later you'll see all the coloured bars come down the screen because it resets itself. That is the issue. And it should still do that. Let's try. There we go. So what we'll do now is we'll put the hacked version on there. Now I am assuming, I did some guesswork um, in terms of the hack. I'm assuming I've hacked the right location within this uh, player. And I'm going to put swap the, the player with the hacked player. So the player, what this is going to do now, is it's going to be writing to the address EE, -E, assuming the SID card is at EE. -E. Now I haven't modified the SID card yet, but the very fact that it's writing to an address where hopefully nothing should clash, in theory, if I've got this hack right, it shouldn't crash, it should just sit there and act as if it is actually playing. Um, I've just noticed, can you see they've got zero RAM? I'm not sure what's going on with that. 536 seems to have lost its RAM between reboots there, strangely enough. So anyway, you can see I've got a hacked C64 SID player there. So if we go into Delhi Tracker and we go into Delhi Players, there's the old one. So I'm just going to shove that into the root for the moment and then stick the hacked one in there. And we'll try it again. It may just crash straight away, got no idea. It just goes to, you know, is this going <laughs> to, this is going to show whether my hacking skills are any good or not. It's been a while since I hacked a 68,000 executable. Uh, Sid. In fact, let's just do that, that same one as before, one two on the run. Okay, is it going to crash? Oh, look. It's crashed again. So, uh, that hasn't fixed it. So, I need to go and have another look at the code, I think, because I've probably hacked the wrong address or something because it didn't reboot this time did it that is the interesting thing it didn't reboot maybe it's because there's nothing at that address nothing's responding maybe you would still get a crash if you just try and I don't know how that would work if you try and write to a random address for something that doesn't exist what happens what picks it up maybe you would still get a crash like that that is possible I don't know. In any case, it didn't reset like it did previously, did it? I think it has bombed, so... Mm, yeah, I might need to go and get the hex editor out again. I could have uh, made a mistake here with the, the location that I've modified. So I'll show you a schematic for this uh, a little bit uh, later. Uh, all you need to know is this here is uh, a comparator. Yeah, it's. I think it says it's a magnitude 
comparator it's a HC688 and the way it works is you have eight bits on one side if you think of a logical side I've colored the, the pins red here just to allow me to do this a little bit easier in a second the modification um, but yeah you've got eight A inputs eight B inputs if you like and then you're comparing the eight bits on one side to the eight bits on the other when they match you you know it will output a signal somewhere so that you, you know you've got a match so this is ideal for you know it's like a combinational AND if you think about it it's like having eight ANDs you know eight bits on an AND yeah um, but the beauty is you can specify whether you want highs or lows on the pattern yeah so what I mean is on you know the side that's coming in the A side for example it's on the comparison is the address bus it's the upper eight bits I think it's like a 23 down downwards eight bits yeah but then on the other side we can you know you can feed whatever you want into the eight individual bits like a high a low a high a low a high a low to get the specific address range you know so you can use this for the address decoding that's what all this is doing it's doing the address decoding so we just need to change it now at the moment you can see there's two resistor positions here three k threes those are the resistors that feed high into the two specific bits here that are set high all the other bits of the eight bits are set you know the other six bits are set low to give us the a zero range So to change it to the E E range, we need a different bit pattern. So what I need to do is I need to. I'm just looking at this board here so that I can work out what I need to do. I need to cut the traces that go to these two resistors here. Anything that's high, I can just repurpose the signal from one of these resistors here. You know, I'll add a wire from the underside to the pin and then join them together. But I need to first of all work out here which ones are joined to ground now and cut the trace to ground so that they're not all joined to ground. The last thing I want to do is join the VCC and ground up and have a short circuit. You can see I've got one of those little piddling DS speakers on here just to test this. Uh, I could scope it or whatever, but now I know also a better way to feed this into a 2000 or 4000 motherboard. The 4000 is easy because you've got the audio input connector. Uh, and it turns out there is one on a 2000 as well. Anyway, we'll do that later. I'm just going to leave it there just for the moment. I need to get that socket off next because I've just been inspecting the uh, one of the other PCBs here. I need to cut a number of traces around here in order to deal with this actually. And actually six bits want to be fed a high from one of these resistors and uh, two bits want to be fed a low right remove the solder with the, the solder pump uh, let's just uh, try and free this I hope this comes off easily well as you can hear it's working it's been painful to get it working if I'm honest and uh, at the moment I can only get it working the 4000 now let me just uh, stop that Hang on. yeah so I had the idea as I mentioned earlier about changing the base address I'm not sure how much of that I filled uh, again it was a whole day of messing around um, I'll talk about some of the things I did there um, in fact let me just take the card out I'll show you so I did take the socket off and inspecting the other board I used that as a guide um, and I proceeded to cut traces can you see there's a little bit of copper there can you see it's just like a little bit goldy tiny little bit that's evidence of that um, and the t I started with the two pads here the ground is the bottom right and the pin next to it is joined to it so I scratched a trace on the top side still joined and then I scratched at uh, uh, the bottom pad there because it was joined on the ground there as well still joined I flipped it over, I started to crash scratch here, you can see I slipped and scratched accidentally there, I didn't damage anything, thank goodness. But I scratched, there's a, you know, a, a pad, um, that second pad there, it's joined to the ground on the bottom, it's joined to the ground on the top, it's joined to the ground on the left. It just, it's, it's a nightmare. I spent like, literally, literally 15 minutes trying to detach that one pin from the pin next to it, and I got nowhere, it's still joined to this, to this point here, even though I scratched everything around it. So I was like, well, this is not going to be easy, is it? There's like eight pins on there that I need to, some of them, six of them at least, need detaching from ground or VCC with, you know, scratching. So, uh, hmm. so what I then did is I took the chip out, I bent every other pin, you know, the ones that we need, outwards, so they're not in the socket. 
and they had a wire joining uh, six of them, yeah, to ground. Oh, sorry, to VCC, I think, yeah, to the, by this resistor. And then the other two pins I had joined with the wire to ground up here on, on the crystal, yeah, where the crystal pad, the alternative crystal. Because this supports an SMB crystal as well as the dip crystal. Um, and then I tested it, and it was doing just the same thing, despite the fact I hacked the XC. So I gave up and then reverted it all back, put the chip back on here, socket, you know, straighten the legs, etc. And thought, let's try it in the 4000. Try it at the 4000, and it still didn't work. I then thought about the implications of the MMU and I reread the uh, documentation for this, you know, the, the Frodo side actually, not the, the SID player. And there's a little utility that comes with it to. Um, disable the MMU. I think it puts in like supervisor mode or something, or puts the CPU in supervisor mode and then does something. I don't know what it does, which basically stops the MMU for from caching. I think or doing something with the access to the address of this. You know the A zero address. So as soon as you run that, there's two commands: enable SID and disable SID. I think, and as soon as you run enable SID and then go into the player and play, it works. So. It's, it's perfect. Uh, the next issue I had after that, it was a little bit quiet. There's two jumpers on the Nano Swin set here. One of them is for the 6581 or 8580 mode, and then the other one is the volume. You know, it depends whether you've got a resistor somewhere in the amplification chain there. And if you remove the, the, the jump, the jumper there, which I've done, it's uh, about 40 or 50 percent louder. It's still quiet. That's my one reservation with this. Well, they've got a few reservations I'll talk about later. But one of my reservations with this, it's a little bit quiet compared to the Amiga's audio. So you can see the next thing I did was make a cable. I just got a black and blue wire, twisted them together, and put some of these. Uh, connectors on here, JSTs or whatever they are. I think the Molex actually. And I put a connector on there. The pad spacing there, can you see that's quite wide versus the, where the positions of the pins are. So I had to literally solder it on, they were squeezed together and then bend them apart. It's a really weird design choice to go for that size spacing, I think. Um, this would be better, I think, with one of the ones where the pins come out that way. Uh, because obviously if you put this on that slot there, mind you it might be alright actually. Yeah, there's enough clearance. It'll be a bit tight, you'd have to bend it over a little bit. But anyway, I'm just going to have this in the top slot. Oh, and I filed these as well. I filed the edge there, you might just be able to see it's indented just a little bit there and there. Because this would not go in here at all. This was a really tight fit, whereas now it just goes in and uh, it's not too tight. Hopefully it should fit just as well into the 2000 as well. Now, so overnight, um, so the next thing is I fed this back to the guys in Discord. Lift 2 was particularly interested in this and trying to understand the problems and helping uh, with suggestions. So he said, oh, I'd like to have a look at this in WinUAE because I could recreate the problem in WinUAE. I could set WinUAE, and if you're not aware, what is WinUAE? It's an emulator. It's an Amiga emulator, so you can run it on the PC. There's probably a Linux version of it. There might be a Mac OS version of it. It's been ported all over the place, WinUAE. But anyway, I loaded WinUAE on the PC, and I configured it as a, an Amiga 4000. I used the hard disk image from this, these systems I've been messing with here. And I could boot up, run the player, and it would work. And I could change the configuration to a 2000. Same card, boot it up, everything fine, you know, up to the desktop. And it would hang... Just like it, just like you saw previously, it would reset the system. You know, in the five three six, you got those coloured bars. It would reset the system every single time. So I let Live Two have those files so he could have a look. He said he was going to have a play with the debugger there to see what was going on, and uh, he all he did is he reverse engineered the hacked executable that I hacked, and he found another reference that I'd missed. I didn't change it. Um, instead of it being A0001, it was A0031. There was another reference in there to the upper 31 bytes of the same address kind of thing. And uh, it's not something I was looking for when I was searching in hex editor, so it's not the sort of thing you could easily, you know, you could find. But disassembling it, it's going to be blooming blim obvious. And I thought, why didn't I disassemble it? I could have done that. I've uh, used disassemblers plenty of times, mostly on 132 stuff. But um, yeah, so he, he kindly disassembled it, found that other reference that I'd missed, and did a change. So between us, we've both hacked it. I, I did the first hack, he did the second hack, and uh, we've changed it to the EE range. So I now need to effectively do the same thing, don't I? I need to take this chip off, 
either bend all its wires out and solder them onto places. I'm kind of reluctant to do that. What I'm thinking of doing is getting two more sockets and use the sockets to configure the thing so that it can just literally sit in a double height socket and then plug in. That way I'm not bending the pins on the actual IC. Um, so I think we'll do that. We'll test that on the 2000 board again and then I may build another one of these. This needs cleaning up as well. You can see it looks very fluxy. I'll get it in the ultrasonic in a bit. So back over at the mat, I've got the board here with the pins marked red there and I've got two things I've done here. I've folded down the pins on the top socket, yeah, all the pins that are relevant here, there's eight, four on each side, and I folded them right over. Some of these I will be able to join, uh, certainly the ones in the middle I think, join together with a little bit of solder or wire or something and they're going to have to join half of them and they're going to join six of them to VCC via resistor and two of them to ground. So on the bottom socket I've removed the pins actually, we can use those in a, you know, to repair the sockets and things so I've got some spare pins there but it just means that when we marry these up there's going to be no bridges at all, I don't even need to put any tape or anything underneath to isolate as long as I stay away from the, the, the pins that do go into the holes there we should be okay. And there we have it, I will detach those just to show you uh, the craziness on the inside. I have not used a resistor on VCC, it literally just, you know, 5 volts joined to two of the connections, uh, I think. Um, sorry, 5 volts joined to six of the connections, ground joined to the other two. So I'll put the uh, diagram up for that later, just so you can see exactly what's required. But if we just sandwich these together, I've just tested on connectivity. Uh, and it's working correctly and the other pins are passing through. So we need to go stick that in the board, put the chip on top of it and use the hacked version of the code and we'll just test it, see if it works with the new address range. Right, let's try and uh, get the chip out. I really should just take the, the SID card out to do this. It's far easier. There we go, let's get the chip out. And we need to get the socket adapter in. Pin one's down here. It's a bit of a tower, but bear in mind this is a test. You don't need this many sockets towering like this in a final product. Little chip in. So again, pin one is at this side, so hopefully everything's making a good connection there. It's huge that tower, isn't it? Look how high it stands. So I've copied the file that Live2 uh, hacked after the hack I did. There's two hacks applied to that. So, we're testing the 4000 initially because, well, it's a level playing field, isn't it? We know it works with the original A0 range. The question now is, is it going to work with the EE range? There's no reason why it shouldn't, actually. Because there's nothing else Zorro related in this machine to clash at that address. And you know what, it's like right on the top of the address range there. So, unless you've got an absolutely packed out system where you've maxed out your Zorro free stuff, you're probably never going to have a clash with something like this. You know, if you've got like 256 meg RAM board or something there, you're not going to have an issue. It's not going to be using that range, probably, I would think. You could always just hack it again and change it somewhere else, move it somewhere else so it doesn't clash. But that would be the beauty of having jumpers on the card. Um, and with the, you know, I'll explain what modifications to do to the executable. You could stick it anywhere. That's the beauty of this. Um, the same hack would need to be done to Frodo, by the way, so I can have a look at that afterwards. Anyway, let's just try this. So, uh, the hack, let's have a look, is here. In fact, let's just try Deli Tracker first of all, because um, it shouldn't work at this, this point in time. It should be almost like there's no SID card. We'll enable the SID because we've got to do that because of the MMU. Let's do that. And I don't think that needs hacking. I had a look at that. I couldn't see any relevance to the address range or anything there. And if we go straight to Deli Tracker, now it shouldn't crash, but it shouldn't do anything, I think. Uh, James Warm, Music, Musicians, G, Galway. Let's just load Never End the Story. That shouldn't work. Yeah, no sound, but the timer is progressing there. That's what I would expect. That's normal behaviour. So, in other words, it's doing the rights to the A0 address range, and the SID card's like, nah, I'm not listening to that range. I'm listening to EE. There's nothing coming for me here. So, hence we get no sound. So if we now close that, and I go into the Delhi Players folder, I think I need to show all files actually, view all files. What I'm going to do is just copy that back into the root there, so I've got the original one. 
and I'm going to the hack is that the one? Hack 2, yeah. Hack 2 folder, put that in there. And if we load Deli Tracker again, hopefully this should work. Please work. Musicians, just do Galway again. Never ended story again. Hey! It works! Fantastic! So, between myself and Live 2, we've just hacked that executable and got it pointing to a different dress range. And obviously, we've hacked the card there with a little adapter for the moment. You could, you know, break the traces on the board if you're that way inclined, but I think that's quite painful to do. A board redesign would be better. So, now we've accomplished that, let's switch over back to the 2000 and test it on the 2000 at that address range. Right, the 2000 is booting up, there we go. I did have to reseat the card, uh, the CPU card I mean, so uh, it took a minute or two to get that working. Right, so if we go into documents, I copied the hack across here as well. Compact flashcard set up slightly differently, I've not got the HSVC, whatever it is, the SID library on here, but I've got a SID folder with the same files we just tried. So if we go into Delhi Tracker, Delhi Players, we'll do the same thing again, we'll just copy out the working one there, that's that. Go to hack 2, put that in here. So we've got our hack, load the player, it didn't crash, that's a good sign. It's obviously when you open it, it was hanging before. Go to our SID folder, and we'll do another random story again. Now, I've not got the audio cable plugged in at the moment, so that'll be the next thing. Oh look, it's going up. <laughs> it's not crashed. It hasn't crashed. We have achieved it. We have success. So again, this was a helpful tip from Liv2. He was like, oh, it's the infernal serial connector you're going to need to use. I'm like, what? What's the infernal serial connector? It's, uh, well, I'm not sure which one it is. It's one of these two here. I think it's this one, actually. Um, it's got an audio input connection that merges, and I found that from looking at the schematics. I was following it, and I was like, oh, yeah, actually, it goes to that connector. Liv2 was on about. So we've got our uh, connector here. The blue is the audio. I just need to find it. I think it's this one. I'm just going to look at the schematics. I think it's pin 6, so just bear with me a sec. Yeah, and I've, just, I've just bodged it in there. That isn't how to connect it, because obviously it's bent one or two pins a little bit. And uh, do you hear what I hear? It's working, but it's very quiet. Very quiet. Quite why it's so quiet here, compared to the A4000, I don't know. But it does work. Behold, it's working. So, yeah, it's a bit quiet. Uh, now, I've got a resistor um, fed to one side of our 202, actually, 3K3 at the moment. So it's quite quiet. But it's louder than it was, because there's a 10K resistor feeds from the audio input, uh, you know, that little infernal serial connector there. So, 3K3, hmm, still a bit quiet. I might just try a 1K. In fact, I'm mistaken. This isn't a 3K3, this is a 1K. So, yeah, you've got to have the volume really loud. You need to amplify it without a doubt. You know, my normal level is about 20. I can barely hear it. But it's the same on the 4000. So, this little board would benefit from further amplification, in my mind. I might have a single channel audio amplifier somewhere. I'm just gonna go see if I've got one, if I have. I may just uh, wire that up and, uh, you know, adjustable. I could just like tweak it a little bit until the volume is almost right. But that is working on a 2000. With a little amplifier there, you can see, I've got it working with a speaker and it's really loud actually. And that's just using this tiny little amp module here. So it's connected to VCC ground, audio in, and then the speaker connections out. So using that little amp module, uh, one of which I've got here, I've balanced it just right and actually fed it into the audio output directly. And I fed it directly to the audio output resistor there. So this is the sort of thing that you'll be able to clip on when I've finished it. I'll mount this on the SID card 
But obviously it's very important you don't get the level too high there or you could damage the audio input on your TV. But this is the only way I've been able to balance this. I've spent a lot of time messing around with the transistors and trying to get more gain out of the transistor. It's just not enough. You need an extra amplification stage and this little LM op amp here is just what's required really. I'm not sure how well it'll work in the 4000 because on the 4000 it's going to be a bit different isn't it? Um, but if I show you the volume level there, 20. And if I pause this, hang on, let's stop it. If I play an Amiga file, hang on, let's just load a game. Right, so I've loaded Alien Breed here. Let's just listen how loud this is at that volume level. Because what I'm trying to do here is get these two matched, roughly. And actually, yeah, that's causing a problem. It's muting that channel. Can you hear that? Probably because it's pulling low at the point there's no volume, which is interesting because it's AC coupled. So, hmm, not really sure how to get around that actually. Right, another improvement. Oh, feeding 12 volts into this is better. This LM386 is designed to operate up to about 14 volts actually. It's not hot, nice and cool. The volume level is pretty low and it's mixing pretty well. I've got it going through a 1K resistor into where it goes into the uh, initial op amp actually, rather than the 10K, it's on the other side of the 10K here. Uh, we can try it on the 10K side. Uh, I'll try feeding it directly in, because if that were, that means you could just plug it straight into the pin on here. But the level I've got there now is pretty well balanced actually. So I'll test this with the uh, 500 next. If I just switch this off, I'll show you the progress I've made here. Um, I've got a temporary lead here, you know, it's going through a resistor and a load of clips and stuff just to get it connected up to the 2000 baud here. If I just uh, pull this out, it comes out pretty easily now actually. So you can see I've mounted the uh, amplifier board there actually. So uh, yeah, it's just totally modular. Bear in mind, this won't be like that. Uh, it literally was just for testing. Um, when I stick this into the 4000, I'll build another one of these for the 2000 I think, but when I stick this into the 4000 I'm just going to move this tower of sockets and just stick this chip straight in and it'll be on the A0 uh, address range there. So you can see I used a bit of heat shrink there and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's quite nice actually, it's nice and tidy. Uh, so the final thing I've just done is build a, a custom cable for this actually, for connecting up to either a 2000 or a 500. We'll test it on the 500 next, but I've got a resistor in line here so that I can clip that onto the relevant place to mix the audio. Um, because the 10K that you get on there is, uh, is too high resistance actually, and I found that the balance is perfect with that, with 1K. You can still hear the uh, Polar Audio just as clear, crystal clear, without any issues. So we'll clip this on and uh, give this a try. So if you get the card in, hopefully I've made that cable long enough for both the 500 and the 2000. Yeah, and you can see the mess of wires here. Look, I had it clipped on down there for a resistor. Another cross cl <laughs> clip to the old cable. Let's just get rid of that. And I can get rid of that now as well. And yeah, the beauty with this is we can just uh, take the clip here and find the relevant place. So on this one here, it's an R202 right on the side of it. So that mixes into the where the audio input goes, but uh, you know we're, we're bypassing the 10K and using a 1K instead. And if we switch it on, you heard the ding there, so that's working straight away. And if you're not aware, the ding was the Nano Swinsid. That's one of the things the Nano Swinsid does when it receives a reset, you know, when it's first uh, reset. So the cool thing with this is I could fit this in my uh, main 2000 now, actually. But before I fit it in the 2000, I would want to do something with that tower of sockets. I'm thinking the best way to deal with that is to just take one of the uh, 688 ICs, bend the, the eight legs out, trim them off, and then just solder some little wires on top of the actual uh, pins there to join everything up and then it can fit just in the socket as normal, it won't be stuck out like a stupid tower of insanity as it is at the moment. Let's try some gold of X. Fantastic. That bass is really good sounding as well. Sweet. So it's perhaps not as clear as you might expect, 
I have heard the said sound a lot clearer, but you know what? That's probably some of the over amplification that's going on here, and it gives it quite a nice sound actually. Certainly, with some of the filter stuff, it sounds very reminiscent of a 6581, despite the fact I am using a Nano Swinsid. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy with it, to be honest. So you may be thinking, there was only one wire. We connected one wire. Why have we got two wires here? One of them is the ground, and I've just simply wrapped it around, just like I did on the other cable, but instead of, it doesn't go anywhere, yeah? Rather than have another clip for the ground, the ground is already joined to the ground, but it makes sense to have the ground wrapped all the way around this to almost its destination, to act as a bit of a shield. That's, that's generally why you will find people twist wires like that, not just to get it looking nice and tidy and, uh, you know, to make a, a single, you know, manipulatable uh, core, if you like, of the two wrapped around each other, but also, you know, if you've got a ground, the ground wrapped around there sort of helps deal with some noise so that you get a cleaner audio signal. So it's just heat shrinked off in the end here, is the point. So here we are back with the uh, 500 plus board from uh, Hell and Back. <laughs> it's had so many uh, videos featured, uh, you know, related to this. Uh, let's get the Pi Storm out, because uh, we... Or are we going to need that? No. I'd have to copy the software and stuff across. Technically, I don't see why it wouldn't work with the Pi Storm, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, I'd rather just use the 536 again. So let's, uh, let's put that out of the way. We use the terrible fire relocator here, which does mean, which does mean I need to get the 2001 off it now. There's buffers right under there. Can you see that? And this is the thing. I'd be really careful. Let's now squeeze that on. That's it. Pins on this look all right. Look, pins are broke off that actually. I got that adapter off Tom Meads. So yeah, we need to now get this here without getting these wires trapped. That's going to be a problem actually, isn't it? Oh, what a pain. Let's just disconnect that for a minute. It might be all right without the thing connected. Yeah, that's gone in. The other problem here is the Super Denise adapter at the back there. It's like, there's just too much. There's too much in here, but yeah, you can see that's all quite nicely marrying up. And just looking at that pin that's underneath, it's not touching anything, so that should be all right. So I'm gonna connect power and stuff first of all. Let's just make sure it boots as is. Then we'll get the, Matt, say, uh, or was it Matthias, I forget, Zorro adapter and get the card in and we'll give it a try with that. Yeah, that booted okay, so uh, let's switch that off. And then we need to connect our Zorro uh, bridge here. That's it, just uh, move across a little bit. It will just about fit on there. And if we get the card in, is it gonna fit all right in here? Yep, yeah, there we go, it is a bit tight there actually. And what I need to do next is go look at the Rev 8A schematics work out where to clip this I want to feed it into the initial one of the either left or right initial channels it's got to be one of the resistors down here somewhere probably which I just need to work out where to clip it on so I'll be right back and the answer is R339 here right hand side of it that is the 10k resistor that used to mix audio but I'm on the wrong side of it really and as kind of expected, it works on the 500 as well. <laughs> Fantastic! So we got there in the end. Um, it's very cool we've been able to get this working with the 500 and the 2000. Hats off to Live2 for helping me uh, hack the uh, player there. I got it half right. <laughs> I just missed the location. Um, the, it goes without saying that we may need to hack the emulator as well, actually, because if we did that, 
then you'd be able to use the emulator as well with the SID card. So watch this space. I may uh, just put an update in the comments uh, down below when I've done that. I'll speak to Liv2. I, I want to understand what uh, disassembler he used, and I'm just going to use the same thing. We'll do that on the emulator and just find the one or two references. Now, there's probably a, there might be more because I had a look with a hex editor. This is the thing when you're hacking an executable like the one, the player for this, it was dead easy because uh, the number of bytes was ridiculously low. It's like, it's, uh, I don't know, 500 bytes or something, the, the size of the play, it might be a K. So when you look at that in a hex editor, there's very little there. You do a search, you find one entry for the address range I was looking for. Uh, and actually there were two, because let's say uh, there was the one I was searching for that started at one, and there was one that ended at 31, and that was the one that Liv found. But when you're looking at the actual emulator code, it's uh, a, a meg or something, I think it's huge. And I did a quick look in a hex editor last night, and I found about several several entries, uh, just for the, you know, A0 uh, range there. But they might not necessarily be, you know, rights to that range in the code. It could be, you know, it could be anything. This is the thing. It could be legit opcodes or something that I'm finding there. That's the difference when you're looking at something that's one meg versus something that's uh, a K or something. Um, but anyway, watch the space. Watch the comments down below. You also need an O2O 0 at least uh, to be able to, to use this player, I think, or the emulator. Um, that was one of the reasons, I'm not sure I showed earlier on, but I was getting like some sort of uh, a crash happening. And it's because I was trying to use a standard 68000 initially with the player, and it would error consistently. Live2 had a look at that error message and was like, oh, I think that's an invalid opcode, actually. I think, is it aimed at an 030 or something? And that was when I said, oh, actually, I've already seen the, the source for uh, Frodo, and I assume the player is the same. It seems to be aimed at the 020 upwards. So it, this will work on an 020. Tested that. It does work on the TF520. Um, it will work on an 030, an 040, or an 060. If you're using an 040 or an 060, you need to use, uh, from the Profrodo archive again, there's a couple of commands there, enable SID, disable SID, you need to use those to work around the MMU. Somehow it's blocking access to rights on that range there, the A0 range, but bear in mind, if you're using the modified executable, and again, I'll stick a drop link, uh, drop. I'll stick a drop box link to that down below. Um, if you use that, obviously, you need to modify your card to work with the EE range. Uh, but that's the only way you'll get this working with a 500 or a 2000. If you're sticking it straight in a 4000 or a 3000, you can go with the original unmodified files. So what's out of scope here in terms of you know things I've not covered in this video, um, and the few things I did cover that cap obviously was the wrong way around. You do want it the opposite way that it's indicated there because it's an input. Um, the regulator didn't fit a regulator because I'm using a Swinsid. I would recommend going with a Swinsid for the reason I pointed out earlier that it doesn't accept reads. So what's the point in wasting a full SID? Uh, and you're better off putting a full SID on a C64 or a C128 or something really. Um, the crystal, you can have the SMD version or the dip, I went with the dip. Remember that the ground and the VCC on this chip here were not connected. Um, the reset, I'll show you the underside of the board in a sec, you need the reset joint to one of the wires there, and actually that's the reset connection. In a 4000 you can get that to the LED signal on the, the extended video slot apparently, so that the uh, software can actually reset the SID. But you know what, I have had no issues, other than if you just stop the player instantly, you know, you close it down, you'll get a hanging note, it'll just go until you power it back off or until you start another SID file. But if you click stop, I'll show you that now, if I just hit stop, it does stop. The other thing I didn't fit to my board, as you'll see in a minute, are these, see these caps here? You've got some caps for filters. I think there's uh, two sets of filters here. So you've got the filters, because there are different capacitance actually, filters for the 8580 and filters for the 6581. I haven't fitted them because you don't need them with a, a Swinsert. Um, and then jumpers here, these two lots of, three lots of pads here, you know, two lots of them. Those are to switch between the filters as far as I can gather, I think. Um, so yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I think we've pretty much covered everything there. I'll just show you where the reset wire goes. So I'll just uh, disconnect my connector there. And of course there's all sorts of different types of connectors you could fit there. That's the other thing. You know, here we didn't fit the input uh, jack. So I mean, I could do that. So on a 4000 you could feed the audio from your CD in there. But 
I'm not sure you're going to gain much. You know why? Because this is mono, yeah? So if you fed your connector from your CD in here, you can have only one channel of your CD player. So you need to think about how to merge with the, you know, the stereo connector. Um, you'd have to make that little flyer or something that goes from two pins to three pin and then have another three pin to join the CD audio in. So you could mix it that way on a 4000. Um, but I have no intentions of putting a CD drive into my 4000 anywhere. I don't think that's don't really see the point so you can see how wide this little board here the ground is there which goes to the ground on the unused headphone socket so you could fit a 3.5 millimeter headphone socket here I had a look the cheapest I could find one was about 15 quid on eBay actually, but if you got them from DigiKey or RS they're probably a pound or two each those so you could put a three and a half mil socket there if you want headphone out but bear in mind it's mono I think the two channels no they're not even oh yeah they are the joined the two channels are joined there so yeah you could do that and use headphones um, the audio output is that pin there so it goes all the way up to where the output of that cap goes the negative cap side of the cap yeah the positive side of this cap is in its uh, normal position this picks up the audio output and the negative side of the cap comes down here and goes to the second pad down there which is the audio input to this little amp the only other thing this amp needs is 12 volts now i chose to go from the transistor there so i know it's not focusing very well there's a risk with that something i just thought of before it's worrying me a little bit but you know what it's all right as things stand and that is if you, you know that you've got ground plane around that leg there if you had a short because of a large blob of solder there and it just happens that the 12 volts short to the ground you could have a very bad day <laughs> if your entire system could go absolutely pear-shaped so the alternatives you could and i did think about this initially you could run that wire for the plus 12 instead of there you could run it all the way down here to this point yeah but that would be a really long wire i really didn't want a long wire running all the way down here that may get caught when i'm sticking a card in and out the alternative would be to you could drill a hole somewhere feed it through a hole and solder it on the underside because you've got less chance of accidentally bridging to ground there um so we've got the ground and vcc wires here to fix you know the missing connections and this is the reset so the reset comes down to uh, that uh, pad there we'll just try and get a bit of a focus there you might be able to see roughly where it is if you look at these two wires here can you see those so you've got one two wires yeah and then a gap that's not used that's not used it's a third one so it's the third one from those two wires there hopefully you can see that and that just means that it gets a reset every time the Amiga's reset the SID gets reset and then of course we've got our stupid tower of <laughs> insanity there uh, I'll put a diagram up for that in a second just so you can see how I have wired that and the jumper over here which I didn't talk about I think this is for the regulator so if you have a, a, a 9 volt regulator here I think this will switch between 9 volts and 12 volts so that you can you know decide what kind of SID you want in here but as I said I wouldn't go with a, a genuine SID go with a nano swing SID so an FPGA SID is obviously going to sound better or an arm SID or a back SID so we'll have a look at some of those uh, soon actually um, but the point I would make with those is you need to be able to write to these and read back to be able to configure them so you need to configure it in uh, I don't know a C64 or something first and then once it's in there it's configured that way so that's just something to consider really and it, it, I think it would be a bit of a waste again a bit like a you know a proper SID I think if you had an FPJ SID in there at the 100 euros or whatever those are it would be a little bit of a waste so yeah just go with the nano swin SID is, uh, is my advice there so I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sorry it was a bit of a bitty video. I started doing a build and then because I got ill, we just jump cut to it being complete. It's like, uh, yeah, it was unavoidable really. Um, I had to spend incredible, incredible time on this actually. Probably a five whole days from start to finish to get this working. But hopefully it's going to make it a bit easier for you to get this working in a 500 or a 2000. So huge thanks to Matt for helping me with the hack there. Um, I did originally, you know, float the idea that maybe it was dress range related. Matt kindly dug into things and said, actually, I think it's clashing on OCS and ECS chipset that's perhaps what the problem is maybe you could have changed the address range i was like well yeah okay i can hack the xc i hacked the xc i just missed a location so it was thanks to live 2 really that we got this working because I, you know you saw i tested it with my hack 
it still hung and I gave up. What I should have done is disassembled the uh, XC and I would have seen that the reference there. But anyway, yeah, huge thanks to Matt Harlem, Live2. It's, uh, it's incredible, really. Because one of the things you might not be aware of, you know, people have been playing with these cards for over the years and just come to the conclusion that it doesn't work in the 2500 and give it up. But uh, you know what we're like, we don't give up on this channel. So uh, yeah, me and Matt were insistent on getting this working, so I'm very, very pleased we, we achieved that. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. A revision of this board might be an idea. I don't know, I might speak to Matt, um, because he's going to have a board outline for a Zorro card like this already. It'd be dead easy for him to tweak this, I would think. I wouldn't mind doing it if I could maybe get the uh, project into KiCad or something. Um, because what I would do is I'd have some jumpers, dip switches even, dip switches for the address range. You just need eight dip switches that toggle between high and low, and you could change the address range. Then you could hack the X executable to fit it you know anywhere within your system but sat at the ee range is quite you know quite high up right at the top of the address range there i would imagine that unless as i said earlier unless you've got a fully kitted out system where you're using all of the zorro range i would imagine you wouldn't have a problem actually um but using some dip switches you could uh, you know change the address range there and then just hack the executable change the two locations within it to uh, accommodate wherever you sat it It'd be nice to fit this LM386 on board as well, rather than having to bodge a little board on here. It's pretty simple. There's only three or four resistors and three or four caps, a potentiometer, coupling cap, and then the actual LM386 itself. So that could all be built on board. Uh, the silk screen could be corrected for that. The ground and VCC connections for this could be cor uh, corrected. The reset could be, uh, instead of just having a pad here, there could be a jumper for that. You could either have it, you know, so you can fly it off if it's in one position to you know your LED signal or wherever and in the other position it could just bridge it here to this pin so those are the things that could be done to this to make it uh, a little bit better I think but anyway hopefully you found that interesting thanks for watching I'll catch you in the next video